Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to well, firstly welcome to this class from Presenter Lab. My name is Chris Moffat. I'm the project lead on the Conference XP project in MSR. I'm just going to give you a short introduction to Richard. Just as a matter of interest, how many of you are somewhat familiar with Conference X, the Conference XP project? Okay, so j just uh, basically, we call Conference XP a research platform, and its um, main goal is to provide an infrastructure for uh, enabling both research development and uh, deployments of, on the one hand, uh, distributed classrooms or distributed learning with high quality audio and video over broadband networks. And secondly, to support the environment that you see here, which is providing uh, an infrastructure for deploying uh, collaborative applications in wireless enabled classrooms with student devices, primarily tablet PC. If you'd like to know more about the overall project of Conference XP, I invite you to visit our booth at the Demo Fest tomorrow morning. Briefly, just I'd like to give you a timeline of Conference XP with the faculty summit over the years as a uh, time point. In 2002, Conference XP was kind of introduced and featured in Bill Gates' keynote, and we did a fairly ambitious demo of a distributed classroom. And I think it's fair to say then the demo was basically put together with uh, chewing gum and, and string. In 2003, 2004, we've made a significant progress, and uh, in particular, we've kind of we branched out from the distributed classroom scenario to also take in the local classroom, uh, wireless-enabled classroom. And so 2003, 2004, uh, we did some more demos, and uh, although those were kind of finely scripted. Also, in, in 2002, Richard and uh, another colleague, Jay Beaver, gave a presentation entitled How to Fail at Distance Learning. They came back in 2003 with a follow-up uh, presentation called How to Succeed at Distance Learning. So we've made some really steady progression, uh, and which brings us to 2005, where we feel the technology is uh, mature enough to put it in your hands and try and give you a real hands-on experience of how it works. So uh, classroom presenter Richard Anderson spent a year in our group in 2002 on sabbatical and essentially conceived of, designed, and developed presenter. He then co has continued the work uh, back at University of Washington and in addition to doing more development and some really interesting research, he's also taken on the role of uh, marketing, evangelism, support. So uh, with that, I'll hand over to Richard. So thank you everybody for attending the demo today. That I've got a number of tablet PCs in the front. The seats in the front are the last ones to fill. So certainly encourage you to sit down at a tablet so that you can participate in today's class. That the most exciting thing about the Classroom Presenter Project has been seeing it reach the maturity where we are deploying it in the classroom and I'm willing to take my tablets into a group situation and can actually concentrate on delivering a lecture without this tremendous fear of a technological meltdown. So. So the goal in introducing technology in the classroom, in my mind, is to create more interaction in the classroom, to give people additional channels to communicate with, with the instructor and with each other. So I design a class so it's very interactive, and I very much like a class where there's a lot of spoken conversation as well as ink-based communication. So a starting exercise that I will do is just to have, have students draw pictures of themselves that this shows off the system and gets people involved. So I've received all of the submissions from you anonymously or semi-anonymously. Uh, and so now I can go through and <laughs> uh, 
and display the submissions going on. And this is the key thing in the, the classroom that I want to do. I want to have a mechanism of collecting student work, viewing it locally, and then deciding how I want to integrate it into the classroom. So just as a picture of the system, Beth. So for, for submitting, there's a button right here that you can press with the pen. <clears throat> so the system is a distributed application with copies running on my tablet, on a machine driving the projector, and on each of your tablets. So when I asked you to draw a picture of yourself, you drew your submissions and then sent them into me and they appeared locally to me on a slide deck. And then I was able to select a slide which is then displayed on the public screen. So in terms of full disclosure, this is a very, very simple application. That the ideas are very simple. We take images from PowerPoint, we distribute them to the class, we take advantage of tablet PC inking capability and have this inking being shared and integrating it into the class. Now, I think it raises a ton of very, very interesting issues such as how do you teach a class around it, that there are some very, very interesting, challenging problems, such as an instructor, how would I understand 100 incoming ink activities? But the basic system is just about sharing ink and images, and kind of the challenge is how do we integrate this into the class? So there's a set of educational theory behind this, and there have been lots and lots of people who have done studies plotting attention in the lecture versus time. And so there are lots of different ways you can measure this. You can measure attention in terms of heart rate. You can measure it in a journal study of writing it down. But the basic study is how does attention vary during a lecture with respect to time? So I would like you to go ahead and draw what you expect research shows attention versus time is, and then send it back to me. Uh, so this is time in, in minutes that I guess are finer grain studies as well. And so go ahead and give, send in your, what you expect to see on attention versus time. And you know, it can be your lecture, it can be your colleague's lecture, it can be my lecture. So here's one submission chosen pretty much at random. That there is definitely a consistent view on what the derivative is going to be, the trend. So a, a certain greater degree of pessimism. interesting curve and so generally the research has shown that there's often a plateau followed by kind of a continental shelf effect and quite often a small upslope at the end, a light at the end of the tunnel effect. 
but generally, you know, there's a recognition that attention spans in lectures are relatively short. And there does seem to be this kind of 15 minute phase where things start to fall off. So an idea that's been around for a long time is, suppose that we interject activities at periodic intervals. And this doesn't require technology that people have been pushing active learning for a long time without direct reliance on technology. But an idea might be to introduce activities at various times in the class to hopefully get a curve which maintains interest. So just at various points, introduce activities. It could be getting up and doing jump, jumping jacks. But do something to reset interest throughout the, <clears throat> throughout the lecture period. And so this is the type of thing that we're trying to do, of using technology to interject activities throughout the lecture. So our basic methodology is to work with a slide-based <coughs> based lecture with embedded activities. And one thing that's very interesting now that we're starting to deploy it is to see the tremendous range of different types of activities that people come up with. That there's a tremendous number of different ways of using this in the class with different objectives of how it's going to work. So in the setup today that we were able to put out <coughs> 30 tablets in the audience. And so some of you have individual tablets, other has have shared tablets. So, so please interact and if you're at a shared tablet, you can have a couple people working. That for a lot of activities, it's been very, very rich to be able to have people collaborating and working together on the tablet. That I actually believe for many scenarios, it's actually better to be working with shared tablets and having students work and collaborate around them than having one tablet per person. Randy? I am, yes. Okay. Uh, need it be a physical tablet that's shared, or could it be a virtual tablet? Two of us drawing on individual tablets, but virtually we're working on the same surface. Uh, that would certainly be a possible extension that we've been more sharing physical tablets, uh, making a virtue out of not having enough. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm just going to go through a collection of activities to indicate the range of activities. And I really want you to participate as students to get the feel of how this would be worked in. And then I will look at the submissions and, and work with them. So one thing that I really like to do at the start of class is to review what went on previously. <laughs> so. So a minute question of what was the most interesting thing from yesterday? Uh, I gave a lecture last week on splay trees. So I started by saying, what do you remember about AVL trees? Which was a challenging question since there was a weekend in between. Uh, so I'm not pushing it quite as far. So, so what was, what's the one sentence you remember from the last hour? What was the most interesting point? All right, it was that, we should that, that write it down and submit it. So, you know, the strength of the submission methodology is that everybody gets to answer, and then I get to see the. So I just found this fantastically interesting in the classroom to be able to get 30 different voices on a question. And, and then for this type of activity, I will often just step through them and show, show the class what people are, are thinking of, of the first course in CS being 
being the best, student recruiting being the key point, Law lawyers tell you to start with a yes or no. Student interest in <coughs> is declining in computer science. One thing I really, really like about having it in ink is I found it powerful to have it in individual students' handwriting. And so I've done this with questions such as in a software engineering class, what's the major cause of software fail failures and got a lot of different ideas that in my class on AVL, on data structures, I got students just to list the key points of AVL trees, which covered the introduction I needed for talking about splay trees. So it's a way of integrating a lot of ideas. And you know, here, I've been able to get 30 different student submissions. And after class is over, I can go back and look more carefully and see, find out what was interesting since I missed the previous or since I was setting up here, but I'm going to be able to get a very good. Yeah. So this is, yes, this is anonymous. I, but you know, technically I do see which machine it came from. But, right, and the anonymous part seems to be incredibly rich for lots of reasons. One reason I really like things being anonymous is it makes it tons easier to talk about student misconceptions. Because you know, I like to get wrong answers so I can talk about them. And if I do it anonymously, I can pick them apart. If I've asked you to come to the board and I talk about it as being wrong, that's the last time you're coming up. That's a plus, but there's also a negative side when you make it anonymous, yeah, such that what, uh, what happens the spam issue? Uh, Interruption. Uh, yes, there are, are, are risks that, you know, we've been doing it pilots in small classes. You know, I've not had significant problems with people doing inappropriate things. The only instance of inappropriate behavior I've seen is I did take my tablets to a fourth grade class, which was far, far more fun than a college class, and the kids loved it. But I was blasting through the submissions without looking too carefully, and I did put up Jimmy Stinks. <laughs> and, you know, so, I, I don't know, but, so, so yes, there are, And there are some activities where it would be great to be able to aggregate that if I've got a collective brainstorm, it would be nice to be able to bring together a lot of things and show them all at once. So let's just move on to another type of activity. And you know, very often, you, know, you want to know, did people do the reading? So here's reading that at least a lot of you were probably assigned. Um, so if you could quickly answer questions one and two. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess not everybody's reading the same thing I've been reading for the last several nights. <laughs> so this is half right. So in the in the first chapter of the <coughs> Half Blood Prince, the Minister of Magic has a meeting with the other minister. George Bush, <laughs> Cornelius Fudge. Is that right? Cornelius Fudge was fired. I won't spoil it then. I'm not giving away the right answer. Uh, 
<laughs> so no, it's not the Dark Lord either. <clears throat> so the first two activities I gave were very short answer, which were kind of assessments that I could use in different ways to discover did people do the reading and you know, I'm really disappointed with you class that um, I'm going to have to reassign chapters one and two for tomorrow. Um, another thing that works really well is to have a more in-depth problem solving activity and you know, this works very very well in groups. So this is the type of problem that you might get if you were interviewing at a large software company although I don't know if this is this one's used yet. So the problem is I give you three coins. One coin has two heads. Another coin has a head and a tail. And another coin has two tails. So you've got three coins. And these coins are in a bag. And so you pick out a coin at random. So you pick one of these three coins at random. You don't look at it. You flip it into the air, and the coin lands as a head. And my question to you is, what's the probability that the, coin, the other side of the coin is a head? And so I'd like you to work in groups and talk with your neighbor, write out the answer, and submit it, with, submit it to me. Yes. They can submit another one. Uh, so if you're careful, you can see the machine names are the same. So in the future, no, these types of things we're definitely considering for the future. So, so go ahead and submit your answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I love the buzz and the discussion. I love the buzz and the discussion. So I started with a half. Yes. Persuaded me that it was two thirds. And then Gerard is going to say it's a half, but I think it's two thirds. So what is it? I know, but okay. So if you go, could go ahead and submit your answers, and then. So I think the most interesting time I've done this activity is that we had a visit day for prospective undergraduate students, which were, were seniors in high school along with their parents. And what was absolutely fascinating was when the buzz started in solving this problem, the kids and their parents were talking to each other, and husbands and wives were talking to each other, and you know, maybe the only time in the day that you know, the kid had talked to their parents explaining it and stepping stepping through. So, so I'm actually seeing a preponderance preponderance of halves, and half is the obvious answer. So why is it one half? 
that it's certainly democratically one half. But yeah, you know, I'm saying, why one half? Right, so there's two coins that have heads. One of them has another head. The other has a tail. So it's 50-50, QED. There's another way of looking at this. The, the experiment that I've run is I've, you've picked a coin and you've flipped it and it's a head. So the experiment is out of the three possible heads, I picked one of them at random. So the conditioning is that the coin is showing a head. So of these three heads, one of them has been picked at random. So if I pick this head, probability one third, it has a matching head. This head, probability one third, it has a matching head. So we're up to probability two-thirds now. And this head does not have a matching head. So the answer turns out to be two-thirds, not, not. No, no, the condition is I've run, I've run the experiment, it shows a head at the end. Conditioned on that, the claim is there's a two-thirds probability. <laughs> As, you know, so I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping from the faculty summit, you know, the highlight is two-thirds versus one-half. Yes. Um, you can submit another answer, yes. So currently that we just get all of them and you know, so, so I'm seeing different answers. And actually, I see this a lot in class that people will submit multiple times. Will they replace the previous one or no. just aggregate? No, I'm getting them sequentially, which is really quite interesting. But you're collecting all of this, all of your questions? Yes. Hmm? But all of the slides, yes. Yes, so I'm up to 121 s submissions so far. Here's another activity that I've used when I'm talking, giving a lecture on the tablet PC and talking about handwriting recognition. And handwriting recognition is a challenging problem. And the way to convey this is here are five words taken from an average person's handwriting. And I would like each of you to, re to recognize these five words. So please. <laughs> the one time when I did this, and this was actually to the tablet PC team, and it's actually the guy who did the recognizer, he just copied the handwriting back again. <laughs> Very good.
Okay, so go ahead and your, submit your answers, and then I'll go on and display the full, uh, full text where this is from, so you can see. <clears throat> so here's the full text that, that this is from. All programmers are optimists. Perhaps this modern sorcery especially attracts those who believe in happy endings and fairy godmothers. So, so this is from Fred Brooks' Mythical Man Month. And so here I ran the text through the handwriting recognizer. And actually a challenge I faced in putting together this slide was writing bad enough so that the recognition results would be interesting. Right, I think if I brought in outside consultants, it might have been. But there's also you know, a line of wanting it to, to give results. So, so here we can see how the, the base tablet PC recognizer did on this particular text. Right, so, so programmers came out preponders, optimists came out as a Puggins, uh, a better dictionary than I have, but I'm showing the options for optimists. So optimists and optimists followed by a period were the second and third choices that I was actually very impressed that sorcery was recognized. And here, green are the words where there's uncertainty. Red is, or no highlight is with confidence. So it recognized sorcery with confidence, which is impressive. And, and the last word was godmothers. So in reviewing the submissions that, <clears throat> so I was quite impressed at the number of people that identified sorcery. So when I looked at this, even though I wrote it, sorcery looked fairly high on the challenge list um, that, that godmothers was the one that was kind of the consensus hardest, hardest one. So in using this type of activity in the classroom, I've been a accomplished a whole set of things. So first of all, instead of just putting up a picture of handwriting and saying, this is this, this is this, this is this, that I had you think for a few minutes about what it's like to recognize words in isolation that there was a competitive, a semi-competitive environment set up where you wanted to get these right, that there would be validation <clears throat> in that I could show the answers, that there was also this two-phase thing where you did an answer and sent it to me before I put up the answer. So if I had just, you told, showed these and asked you to think about them, you know, that you would have said, Programmers, optimists, that e that's easy. And then when I put up the answers, you would say, attract? Yes, I had attracts. So by sending in the, the answers, it did kind of commit individual results. It also gives everybody a stake in what I'm displaying. Another thing that's very, very fascinating that I find in the classroom is that students have a tremendous amount of interest in just seeing their work displayed. So a very interesting behavior that I've seen in the class is that when students are answering, a lot of students start to put little, <clears throat> little pegs on their work to show them to me. So for example, in one of my classes, there was a student who would always put a little Canadian flag on his student submission. And so he'd regularly do this. And the purpose 
was so that when he saw it displayed, he could immediately recognize it. And the people sent, sitting around him might know that, yes, it was his work. So, you know, for example, you know, Steve Wolfman sitting up front, you know, when I start to see a lot of, a lot of submission tagged with dogs, I will have a fairly good sense that they're coming from, from Steve. But in the class of a whole, you're not going to know that it was from Steve. So it's this tagging is a very, very interesting behavior. And again, it's one that we see emerge very, very quickly in the classroom. And <clears throat> this is certainly to be determined. And you know, there are some activities where I do make an effort of quickly stepping through a lot of them just to verify to people that they are coming, coming in. Yes, this is certainly an issue. And so it certainly takes thought in how you incorporate this work back in. And you demonstrate to students that there is a personal value in, in submitting things. That, you know, I can certainly imagine in the long run, you know, having some, su some automatic support to kind of hint the instructor to give a diversity of people submissions coming up and you're know, providing hints in that way. Or later on, you can put of them to the web and allow the students to have access to them and comment uh, afterwards. <laughs> so here's an example from the data structures class that I gave <clears throat> gave last Monday, which worked very well. So here I was talking about splay trees. And first, my introduction to splaying was just motivating the process of splaying by saying we're moving the node D up two levels at a time with a basic rotation operation. The students had seen rotations in ABL trees, so it wasn't completely foreign. First steps show how it moved up. And then I talked about trees, branches being zigs and being zags, and mentioned there were four cases, a zigzag, a zigzag, zag, zig, and zag, zag. And then on this slide, I worked through and I presented to the students what the rotation operation was. And I talked through it and spent a few minutes you know, talking about the process of bringing the branch through. That, And then I'm not going to ask you to do this one since maybe data structures is unfair to ask about. But then I gave the activity of having students do the next example. So I showed Zig Zig, and now I wanted them to work through. And what was fascinating to me after I prepared this and before I gave it is I had no idea of what to expect. So I've been teaching data structures for 20 years. And I realized that when I talk about something like the rotations in a splaying, I really don't know are students understanding it or not. And so you know, I gave this exercise and I didn't know how many students would be able to do this two-step rotation. That when I teach a class that there are the few people in the front row who are nodding their heads and seem to get it, and there are the 20 students in the back row who are reading the newspaper and probably aren't getting it. But what was fascinating was to get the data back and to see what percentage of the students could do this, this fairly straightforward operation and, and which couldn't. That in my class, it turned out that roughly 50% of the students gave the correct rotation, and the other 50% had something incorrect. And the incorrect answer was consistent, so I was able to go over it and show why it didn't work. So it was fascinating to me just in this class to be able to get hard data about how many people understood, how many people didn't understand. That another type of activity I like to do in class is just a collective brainstorming. Collective brainstorming, soliciting ideas from the audience and collecting them. So 
this will be the last activity of class today. So, so go ahead and tell me what problems, problems you think might arise. So here I am pitching a technology, talking about why it's great. But there's, you know, what are the worries? What are your concerns? What problems do you expect to see in the class? So please go ahead and submit and. Okay, so this is great seeing, seeing the concerns. I'm surfing the web. I, that actually there's a trick that we, or approach that we use sometimes, so this is not a problem. Is anybody surfing the web right now on a tablet? And the answer is no, because we've got an ad hoc network, so it's not connected. Uh, So there's you know, always the problems of chatting and email. Here we are disconnected again, but the presence of devices in the classroom, another distraction, do definitely happens. And you know, I certainly have you know, seen at times fairly rich doodles. Uh, you know, this is not technology specific though. That yeah, I believe that students have doodled on their notebooks as well. Um, video games, yes, Inkball does seem to appear fairly frequently. Um, distraction factors, distractions. Uh, so this certainly can be a problem. And when I'm delivering a lecture from the tablet PC, not even connected to the classroom, there is an issue of of viewing the screen and writing on it. And with a tablet, this can actually be more pronounced than with a regular laptop. It's just the viewing angle that if I'm writing, it is going to be, be looking down. So I think this is something to address. I actually meant, excuse me, beyond what you said, Richard, I also meant that you, I would be tempted to look at all of the responses and then I'd never be looking at the students. Oh, okay, so, so there's, both, right, there's both issues. There's, Right, so several issues. One, and one that, you know, I've watched people use tablets lecturing, and the eye gaze problem is one that people need to be made aware of. Um, so just making the, the laptop delivery problem. But that's another, another big issue is just how long you take studying them and, you know, the appropriate way. Now, I think one thing that's important is to make sure that the students have the model of what's going on. So that the students understand that I'm leaving the submissions and looking at them. You know, and if they know I'm doing that, it's going to be better than if it's just this kind of sudden two minute coma I go into. Of course, this is not a new problem. I had professors when I was in school where looked more at the blackboard than they looked at the students. And so, uh, yes. it's, it's, it's really the professor, right? Right. So, Right, so we're able to reproduce a lot of existing problems with technology. <laughs> there, there is another issue, which is a social uh, aspect of it, which is students tend to respond in a very short way. And in real life, I mean, they have to stand up and make an argument and make a whole presentation as to why <laughs> uh, they are justifying their answer. And by going through the tablet PCs, they are not getting this aspect of, uh, of social interaction. 
so, <clears throat> right, all of these are important, can be designed into class. When I'm teaching a large class, you know, there's just not time to have many students get a social interaction. The other thing that can come out is being able to solicit answers that I found there's more social interaction in my classes when I'm using this technology than when not. So for example, if I do have this problem, people get vested in, they're more inclined to speak, and on this two-thirds versus one-half, you know, there would be a discussion of the different answers that's prompted. So I think it's you know, important to leverage this technology to then include the other social activities. Uh, considering, again, the possible dangers, uh, first a question. Do you have a sense from the technology of who's not responding? Uh, not currently. Okay. So, so we're just running pilots, and I've been happy in my classes with generally the rate. You know, I'll see 14 of the 18 students, and and for a few classes we've gone back and looked at the distribution and. You found that there were a few people not on each one. Because, well, two comments. Because one of the things, of course, you get out of looking at faces and calling on people is you, you know who's trying to hide. And yes. That, that becomes pretty obvious, and that can be very useful information. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, I strongly encourage interaction in my classes and have discovered that some people are actually quite uncomfortable with that. Uh, on the end of the term evaluation, <laughs> there are those people who say they really hated the fact that I call on them when they're yep. not volunteering. And I know this is a longer term mm -hmm. issue, and it's probably a second or third order issue in, in light of this very interesting stuff you're doing, but I wonder what the long term reaction to knowing that you may be on the spot the moment mm -hmm. you walk into class, you can't escape yeah. kind of feeling might be. That I've certainly heard the flip side from far more students that they love having this mechanism of being able to submit answers and have them looked at and being very intimidated and so I think it gives a voice to a lot of people who would like to contribute, but don't. One of the assumptions that seems to be being made is that using the tablets is going to have the instructor stop using all the other ways that the instructor usually interacts with students. And my experience has been that most instructors who are using any new technology integrate it with the things they were doing in the past. And so I, too, call on my students uh, whether they volunteer or not. And I certainly would do it with this whether or not, you know, I mean, I, I don't think using this disables uh, the instructor from using other approaches. Yeah, I think this is very important, and at least for my style of use, I find it makes it easier to increase the other as well. Dropping tablets. Um, remarkably, that of our donation of 35 HP tablets, I only know of one of them hitting the floor, and that was when it fell off a cart that I was driving. And it survived the three-foot bounce test just fine. Uh, I've actually got quite comfortable with my tablets and being willing to hand them off to nine and 10-year-olds. So uh, yes, a $1,500 piece of technology is something to be careful with. Kind of the future of this and what you would, you know, over the next couple of years, like in what ways you'd like to extend this, What what attributes of this would you like to increase or add or? So, so right now I think the most interesting part of it is seeing what happens in the classroom, how different instructors take advantage of it. So we've got something that's, that's moderately robust. So, so with some effort it's usable in the classroom that right now we're doing, going through a reworking of the software so that hopefully within six, nine months, we'll have a new basis of the software that it's going to be much easier for other people to extend as well. That for kind of viable in-class software, you know, there's a tremendous number of other things that it would be nice to have. So there was the question of how would you aggregate answers? You know, that there are other types of activities that would be great to include. That of course it should work in a broader range of platforms that be able to support keyboard input as well as tablet input, that my model of deployment is I would like students to be bringing their own personal devices into class and have that, that interact with the instructor's device. That you know, we 
it's not a viable long-term model to have Professor X beg a donation of 30, 60 tablets and then bring them and set them up in class. That that's the right thing at this stage to experiment for people to figure out what to do. But long-term, we want something that works with student-owned devices across a wide range of platforms that people just connect, distribute course material, and can interact with it. Please. I understand the need for activity to keep the students occupied, but here you're going for more than that. You're, you're yes. trying to get a real-time uh, reaction. And is that really necessary? So the real-time reaction, I think, is very important, being able to display people's work and integrate it into lecture. So you know, I have kind of this list of good things that activities help, that one of the strongest parts has been when I've had multiple answers come in and I can display student misconceptions and talk about student misconceptions. That that's where I've certainly seen quite a few students with kind of these aha moments. And getting the student data, you know, the students answers in real time, I discover a lot of misconceptions that I didn't even expect. And so getting unanticipated things, being able to draw them in. So that's where the real time aspect becomes very important. And you know, that, the activities and the interaction that it's all kind of part of the pedagogy that we're. Does this application, does this application depend on it being a tablet or since it runs on the conference XP, I, could students do it on a regular laptop and use their mouse to draw? Yes, so this runs on a regular laptop as well. Uh, that the tablet ink provides a lot of richness and value. And long term, we want to do things such as have better keyboard support. So you, know, you type something in. So currently, a, a laptop. More, mm -hmm. but if it is, uh, you know, if the answer involves a lot of oral response, isn't it going to be a bit slow to use in a class? Uh, so written response. Yeah. I, so I guess you could certainly get the feel for it of seeing the size of answers that I was getting to the various questions and kind of one or two sentence answers people can submit fairly quickly, and you know, I feel I can integrate a number of them in. So it's certainly doesn't work if I ask for you to write a paragraph. But for short one or two sentence answers, it works well. And especially in the types of things I teach, such as a data structures class, to be able to you know, give someone a tree and have them annotate the tree, the flexibility of ink is tremendous. So this slide just recounts essentially what Chris started with. The, saying that this started in 2001, 2002, when I was on sabbatical here, building on top of Conference XP, and into, this is integrated into future releases of Conference XP. And you know, at the start, I did stress the simplicity of what we're doing. And I actually think that's you know, part of what works really well, that you know, just the richness of ink and and even for the simplicity that you know, I'm thrilled that we're at the point of being able to use this in the classroom. I'm stunned that it's five years after we started. So, so we, but it, it's great having kind of everything fall together so it can be used in the class. And so that I've been able to, to lecture for an hour and I can see that all of the machines are still connected and working just fine. So. I'd be very happy to talk with people one-on-one. -on -one. The software is available for download that we're just in the process of releasing the version 2.0 that I've been promising Classroom Presenter 2.0 for a long, long time. And finally, the promises are ringing true. Uh, feel free to contact me by email. Chris Moffat is in the back, one of the many blue-shirted folks. Um, contextp at microsoft.com and their website. So thank you very much.